as well. Tonight is driver's ed. Okay, how does that, what does that have to do with the Christian life? All right, driver's ed. You get a new driver, and Reese, you're 16, right? Yeah, okay. 17. I thought you were mature. So. Uh, you get a new driver, hasn't been behind the wheel very much, and you had a, get a seasoned driver, which, by the way, has his own brake pedal. Have you noticed that on the driver's ed cars? Very smart. Uh, for some reason, my car wasn't equipped with that. I've got to work on that. You get somebody who knows what they're doing, who's been around the block, literally, a couple times, and they help the new driver practice their driving skills. Did someone help teach you what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Okay, those of you who have been believers for a while, someone came alongside you and helped you and taught you and discipled you and mentored you. And how are we doing with passing that on and getting into the other side of the car now and helping somebody else who's just getting started in their faith, in their walk, in their relationship with Jesus. And that's what tonight is about. And I want to start with Hebrews 10 and verse 25. So let's go there, please. Hebrews 10 and verse 25. All right, have you seen this before? Okay. This is the church, and this is the steeple. Open the doors and... Oh, wait, I did it wrong. Where's all the people? And then you do it again, right? This is the church, this is the steeple. Open the doors and there's all the people. All right. When people hear the word church, what do they usually think of? A building. We have one of those. It's brilliant. It's beautiful. Beautiful building. In fact, uh, we're, um, John's going to put a picture up. Uh, Pastor Rawls, who was here back in the 50s, who helped do a lot of, and 60s, do a lot of the building that happened here, uh, the buildings we see now. He was involved in a lot of that. Uh, there's his picture. He was riding wrecking balls before they were uh, cool. All right. Um, that's him. He is sitting on a wrecking ball. Who was here when that happened? Okay. Earl, Mary, you remember that? Anybody else? See, Bob, all right, who else remembers that? You guys are babies, because that was 1958, so you, anyway. <laughs> um, they, they just finished building this sanctuary, and he rode this wrecking ball up to the top and put the, the copper cap up on the top of the, I guess, the cross. That's up on, on the little cross that's up on top of our steeple. And that was like big grand opening celebration Sunday. Uh, people, when they think of a church, they think of this building with a steeple, and that's a church. In fact, we say that. I'll meet you at church. We don't say, I'll meet you at the church building, although technically that's more correct, because the word church in the Greek is the word ekklesia, which means the ones who are called out. Hey, hey. Come follow Jesus. All you guys, let's get together. We are the church. We are the ones that God has called out. Called out from where? The world. We were just doing our own thing, and Jesus Christ changed our lives and called us out. He said, I want you to be my disciple. And he changed us. And we're now his. We're now his disciples. We are the called out ones. So the church is the people. So that's why Hebrews 10 and verse 25 has to do with the called out ones. So let us not give up meeting together, but encourage one another, and even more as we see the end approaching. So let's break that down. First, let's not give up meeting together. Have you ever had a morning where you thought, oh, I just don't feel like going to church today? To, to hang out with, to meet with the church today. Have you ever had a, have you ever had a, felt like that? It's like it was a long night last night. The alarm goes off, and the snooze button is right there. And, okay, I'm talking about myself. You guys may not have this problem. Or, or maybe it's a Sunday night, and it's beautiful. And you're out enjoying the beautiful air, and you remember, oh, we got summer tune-up tonight. And you're thinking, 
but I also would really love to go out on the lake or I don't know, do something. Do you ever have those, those temptations not to hang out? This verse says, don't forsake the, the assembling of ourselves together. We need each other. Lean on me. We need to lean on each other. We need to get together and encourage one another. And the last part of the verse that Mike read, and so much... Yes. And do you see the end times approaching? Do you see the world getting worse and worse? So we need to meet together even more. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean in this building. You know the church can get together somewhere other than 1919 Delaney Avenue? It's possible for the, the church. Well, that's true. We can meet in the gym. That's over there. But I, we could meet. We could actually meet at somebody's house. And it would be the church coming together, encouraging one another even more as we see the end approaching. You know, and I don't know if anybody's ever asked you this. It'd be a good, good way to answer it. Does anybody ask, why do you have Sunday morning worship services? Why do you get together on Sunday night? Why do you meet on Wednesday night? You know, could, like, isn't Sunday morning enough? What's a good way to answer that? Sunday's the Lord's Day, so it, meet, it makes sense. We get together on Sunday and we celebrate the Lord. But, you know, why Wednesday? Do we really need Wednesday? We get together and we pray. The last part of that verse says, so much the more as we see the day approaching. You know, it's not even just Sunday and Wednesday. I need somebody to encourage me Monday. That doesn't mean I get together with somebody and meet, but, but somebody might text me on Monday and say, praying for you today. Or I need to text somebody else or call somebody and let them ask how they're doing and see if I can pray. Encourage each other throughout the week, keeping up with one another. Okay, suppose you're dating somebody. You're, you're not married yet. You're engaged. Well, not even, well, let's say you're engaged. You're, you're engaged. Um, see, I don't see a Nissa in here. All right. So let's say you're engaged. Okay. Uh, and I could pick on her because she's the only engaged person here right now. Sorry. Okay. Uh, let's say you're engaged and you only see your betrothed, your, your uh, fiancé, once a week just on Sundays. You, you hang out together on Sundays, then you don't talk to each other at all. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Did I skip a, word, a, a day in there? Monday, Tuesday. Okay, anyway, the other six days you don't talk. And then Sunday comes around, you hang out, right? And then you don't talk to each other Monday, Tuesday. That, that'd just be weird. And that's kind of like how it is with the church. We're the family. We, we are each other's family. We hang out together, not necessarily here all the time, or just different places, you know, you, the church could be at Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, I, I was with the church on Dunkin' Donuts yesterday morning. Not the whole church, just I was meeting with a small part of the church. But we were there. We were the church. We were meeting. Hebrews 10, 25. Don't forsake the assembling of, our, of ourselves together, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. Look over to Ecclesiastes. That's right after Psalms and Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And let's start in verse 9. By the way, everybody get this handout, the church covenant. We're not going to read it. This is just for your homework to take you home. This is a copy of, uh, of what we have covenant together as a church, what we promise to do each other's lives. So that's for you to read. All right, Ecclesiastes 4, starting in verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return reward for their labor. For if one falls, the other will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one be warm if he's alone? Though, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Do you see the warnings against being by yourself, getting alone? That's what Satan wants to do. He wants to take us and divide us out so that we're all by ourselves. And then he wants to attack us, divide and conquer. That's his strategy. Instead, we need to be together, working with each other. The other verse I wanted to point out to you is Proverbs 27. 
and verse 17. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. You know, when I hang out with Wayne Groover, he sharpens me. He is, he is yet, how's that go? Uh, Y-E-M-O-L-E. Yeah. You enrich you, my ongoing living experience. Yes, yes, he does. He, he, <laughs> he enriches me tremendously uh, just spending time with him. That's iron, sharpening iron. It's like two blades just sharpening each other. And we're spe- it was Proverbs 27, 17. Did I get the reference wrong on that? Okay, that's right. All right. Proverbs 27, 17. It's why we get together. We're sharpening each other. Iron, sharpening iron. Encouraging each other. Enriching each other's lives. Before we break into our small groups, I wanted to leave you with this challenge, which comes from Hebrews chapter 5. And this is a challenge to the mature members of our church family. Hebrews 5, the writer of Hebrews is talking to the church here in verse 12. He says, By this time you ought to be teachers, but now you need someone to teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, who by reason of use have had their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The more you work out, look, the more you work out, the stronger you become, right? The more time you spend in God's word, meditating on it, chewing on it, the stronger you become spiritually. But some of us have been hanging around and we've been starting getting to the point where we've been depending on Pastor Troy for our spiritual intake. And that's what milk is. Milk is pre-digested food. Okay, babies can't eat steak. So mom eats steak, and then we won't go into the details, but it becomes milk and the baby drinks the milk. So the baby's getting all the nutrients, everything that the baby needs, which is basically coming from the steak, but it's been pre-digested for the baby. Well, that's basically what the preaching of God's word is. Somebody has already digested it. When Pastor Troy's up here, he is sharing to us, with us, he's looked into God's word, he's meditated on it, he's prayed about it, And then he shares it with us to challenge us. And we receive that. But how much work did we have to do to to get that truth from God? No, you did all the work. We just sat here. (laughs) So if that's the only spiritual nutrition that we get, we're living off of milk. And we're not going to grow very much. We need somebody to challenge us to get deeper into the Word for ourselves. And that's where our Sunday school classes come in, because it's a small group where we we know what the passage is ahead of time, and we read the passage ahead of time, right, before we come to Sunday school, and we study it on our own. And then when we come to Sunday school, we talk about it together and chew on it. And that's where we're getting into some meat. The... The meat is when you take God's word and you're chewing on it yourself. You're learning what God has to say to you with, and other people are doing it together with you. You're not getting it pre-digested from another source. That's why it's good to go to a commentary and read what, what great men of the past have written about God's word. But it's, God expects us through the power of the Holy Spirit to open up his word. And some of you are big fans of inductive Bible study. That's getting, seeing what the Bible says and learning from it. That's getting, the, getting to the meat of God's Word, chewing on it, making it part of your every day. Some of us should be teaching others. That doesn't mean standing up in front and being a teacher, 
That means taking someone else who is newer in the faith alongside, hopping into the driver's ed car with somebody and saying, let me teach you, let me help you figure out how the stick shift thing works here. It's called a clutch over there. You heard about the, uh, the new way that they've uh, developed to help prevent cars from being stolen in the new, this next generation. It's called a stick shift because nobody 20 or under can drive it anymore. So never, no, I'm kidding. Uh, it actually happened a couple weeks ago. Somebody tried to carjack and steal a car and they couldn't figure out how to get the thing to go because <laughs> couldn't get into first gear. My first car was a, a Volkswagen stick shift. So I love those, just love that car. It's gone now. I killed it. But don't tell Reese that. Um, I was going 75 in the driveway. God has called us to come together. We're doing that. And then also to get someone else and get together with that person and encourage and mentor them. So as we break up into our small groups, we're going to be asking questions like, tell us about who mentored you in the Christian faith. And then who are you discipling right now? Whose life are you investing in? God's given you a house or apartment or someplace to live. Who have you had over into the house to encourage? Just to share some time together. Use that house to bless others with. That's what driver's ed, this part of summer tune-up is about. The church, the called out ones, that's us.